Welcome back to Wells Tech. This is episode 338 for Tuesday, April 22nd, 2014. Show about technology and ministry. We get together each week, Tuesday, 4 o'clock central. If you'd like to join us, Wells Tech Live. That Wells.net is the place to go. Or your favorite podcast, uh, Catcher or Video Catcher, whether it be audio or video you're interested in. We're out there, so go to wellstech.wells.net to find out all that information. I'm joined each and every week. I am, by the way, Martin Spriggs. I'm joined by... Sally Draper, coming to you live from beautiful New Orleans, Minnesota, where spring has sprung. Spring has sprung? Yes, we're enjoying some warmer temps and, and budding trees. And you, Martin, are another year older, another year wiser this week, huh? Uh, I survived that. Another trip around the birthday. sun. Yes, uh, <laughs> but I was kind of overshadowed, which I was not unhappy about, because uh, being a grandpa now, the uh, the new grandson got all the attention last week. He was uh, for reaffirmed in uh, in the Easter service, which was kind of cool. Oh, wow. It was an outdoor service down in uh, uh, Greenwood, Indiana, where my daughter and, and son-in-law go, and Murray was affirmed there in the great outdoors. So it was uh, kind of neat. Well, welcome to the family, Murray. That's awesome. What a what a wonderful blessing our baptismal water is. It is, yeah. So, um, but we're doing a podcast as we normally do, 338 of them, and um, it's kind of interesting where we find some of these topics. Uh, none of you would probably want to sit in on our planning meetings. They're so disorganized and you know stressful and. You know, what are we going to do next week, and what about the next week after? And it seems like next week comes sooner than we would like, and we've got to figure this out. But fortunately, we know a lot of people these days, and we go to a few conferences and meet more people. And that was the case with our topic for this week. Last October, Sally and I got together with 38 of our closest friends out in Las Vegas um, for a distance outreach and technology conference and the subject of that was specifically those tools and things that you know should be in the toolbox of congregations looking to reach out or looking to extend their reach um, through technology and uh, share that precious word of God but the format was kind of uh, our unconference format where we let the attendees, the the 40 that were there, uh, figure out what we were going to talk about. And we kept a couple slots open. We we learned a lesson from mm -hmm. a previous unconference, and we did a little pre-planning where we polled everybody and we put together, I think we put together 10 topics, but we had 12 slots. So we had two, I think, slots that were available for anything that we wanted to talk about. And one of those things that a lot of people wanted to talk about was our topic for today, entitled The Dark Side of the Internet. Yeah, I think we probably could have a whole conference in and of itself when you start talking about the dark side of the Internet. And certainly, um, we spend a lot of time on this podcast focusing on uh, God-pleasing ways to use technology to serve the spread of the wonderful gospel message. But... Um, there's there's a flip side to that technology that we need to be educated about. Um, we need to consider its impl implications for our churches and schools, and take steps to um, to ensure our data integrity and security and those kind of things. Yep. And as you'll hear about in the interview, um, there are a lot of dimensions to this. And a couple people that were at that conference. Um, were Jazz Lundquist and Mike Klebick, who we asked to join us and talk about that. I think Jazz was kind of the the driver behind this session because, uh, as you'll hear in the interview, she uh, she had spent some time doing some research on at least one dimension of this. So we asked them to come on, and uh, we've had them on before when we were out in Bethany. Great interview. They uh, they uh, they know what they're talking about. They're very personable, and they. Uh, they bring with them some good experience and, and good advice. So we should play that interview now, and then we'll circle back and hit some of the highlights. We're very happy today to have Jazz Lundquist and Mike Klebig joining us uh, on the podcast. Uh, welcome, Jazz and Mike. How are you? Real We're good. doing great. I assume you, you are in San Jose. 
Yes, we are. Gorgeous, gorgeous day. Great. Beautiful spring day. Roses outside the window. It's awesome. Jazz and Mike are um, volunteer um, extraordinaires at Apostles in San Jose, and uh, we've actually had them on the show before uh, when we had a conference out in Mankato, Minnesota, and they've been very active in a lot of work for the Synod and specifically for multi-language publications. Before we dive into some of that stuff and the topic of the day, uh, maybe just introduce yourselves a little bit, what you do for a living, uh, what you do in your congregation, hobbies, those kinds of things, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, no problem. My name is Michael Klebig. I've lived and worked in Silicon Valley for about 25 years. I work in the semiconductor industry in thermal applications. And I'm Jazz Lonquist, Mrs. Klebig. I am a screenwriter and I have credits in television, hundreds of um, video and short films, screenplays, and the topics are everything from lowriders to ice skating dogs to DNA. <laughs> um, and since we live in Silicon Valley, many of my scripts are also about technology. Cool. So both, uh, both Jazz and I are members of, of uh, Apostles Lutheran Church here in San Jose. And as volunteers in our church, we help run our video studio there, and we use our experience in media and in technology to assist various mission fields with media distribution solutions. So big technology fans. Right. Uh, in I fact, our little five-year-old granddaughter is in robotics camp at Apostles this week. <laughs> yeah, she's there today. That makes sense. If you're going to have a robotics camp, it ought to be in, in uh, Apostles in San Jose. That's cool. Absolutely. It's run by um, a member, <coughs> a really wonderful mom, but she also is a PhD from Stanford, although she's quick to say it's in chemical engineering. Uh, oh. But we, we still let her do it. Needless to say, she's pretty smart. So that that's cool. And before we jump into kind of the dark side of the Internet conversation that we hope to talk to you about, uh, you've done a number of things uh, in the Synod, per se, for multi-language publications and uh, for our mission field. you want to talk a little bit about what you've done there? Um, yes. I mean, in, our, in the workplace, we're, um, we're often helping high-tech clients, Microsoft, Intel, um, but we also like to support the poorest of the poor with technology. Um, so through mission work, we've, um, or through technology, we've been able to support some mission work, uh, especially with the portable media distri uh, distribution system that, um, that might PDS, help right. design. PMDS. PMDS, that's <laughs> it. Yeah, right. And that is a um, little portable projector that can play almost any kind of media. It doesn't require electricity. It weighs less than two pounds, the whole kit, so it can easily be carried into um, a place with no electricity, poor access, areas of high illiteracy, and it's just been a fantastic tool. In fact, we just finished doing um, the Haitian language recordings, um, dubs for the two films, Road to Emmaus and Come Follow Me, and if all went well, those aired on television in Haiti, and now they can be, be aired from those PMDS projectors. Um, and uh, so that was a real blessing to work on that project. And a lot of fun. Very exciting. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful, and thank you for your service there, and thank you for your participation in a couple of conferences that, that we've been at, both Sally and myself. Oh, our privilege. Yeah. You're welcome. Right. Um, just to kind of key off of that, we saw you last in Las Vegas last fall at the Distance um, Technology and Outreach Conference, and one of the breakout sessions kind of um, that came out of from the people that were there was the need to look at something we've termed the dark side of the Internet. And I think, Jazz, you... You were um, kind of a leader in this breakout session, in particular because of some of your film experience. Maybe tell us a little bit about um, that digital dark side that you had examined in a film that you were involved with. Okay, that uh, the digital dark age was an assignment script that I wrote for the Computer History Museum. Um, the film is available online from their website, or if you get the chance, go to the museum. It's just spectacular. You'll have a great time. Now, as with most technology scripts, I did have a content expert. Um, but that said, screenwriters are really trained to ask what if. And in the digital dark age script, the what if question is, what if the data created in the digital age, and that includes literature, art, discoveries, photos, records, what if it's not accessible in the future? 
now this isn't science fiction and the museum is not the only credible source that's um, asking this question and raising the hue and cry. The fact is that we use rapidly obsolete technology to create today and we use fragile ephemeral methods to store data and so there is a risk. Financial, there's no real financial incentive for technology companies to make new devices that are backwards compatible. They are, of course, focused on developing new, faster, more sophisticated technologies and pushing the boundaries. Um, and so that's part of the problem. If you go back just 30 years, the digital data that would have been created for small businesses or churches or families, consumers, it's probably stored on those old five and a quarter inch floppies. <laughs> and how many of us today have the hardware, the software, the program code, and the passwords even to access that old data. Yeah, I do. <laughs> oh, good for you, Mike. Yeah, I'm just reminded. Well, I just had a conversation with a pastor recently who talked about uh, transitioning to a new call, and he had left all of his documentation on three and a half inch floppies in the parsonage, and apparently there was a leak, and they all got destroyed. So the new pastor coming in, yep. like a mission setting, he didn't have all the contacts and names and things that had been stored um, on that format. They were gone. And so I think it's a very real thing um, for our churches and schools to be aware of and hopefully protecting against as well. The challenge that we're And it, it's not just an... It's not just an accident that happens to the data. It's just the natural aging of the media and many other factors. Right. Well, I mean, like Janice mentioned, we have this Commodore computer. It's been in storage since we upgraded to a really powerful 286 in 1985. <laughs> it hasn't been plugged in since. So the work that we did on that computer from 1980 to 1985 is on five and a quarter floppies. And we, we never migrated it to a newer format. It it'd be difficult to remember even how to use that old machine. Now, you know, think of this same problem in corporations, governments, or in our cases, churches. Some of that data may already be gone. I think in general, and this is probably more often the, the rule than the exception, uh, there's probably even a shorter horizon for our churches and schools because of the volunteer base that is put yeah. in charge of some of these technologies where you've got somebody who knows something about something and says well this ought to be what we should do he or she's gone in two or three years and then whoever picks it up may or may not know that and then very quickly you have built-in obsolescence and uh, I see it all the time in church uh, management software solutions and you mm -hmm. know, website development those kinds of things where churches are, and schools are constantly trying to, to stay ahead of this thing and the media itself that we are storing on the tapes, the floppies, cass cassettes, the data is vulnerable to age. It's vulnerable to moisture, magnetic fields, surface damage. You don't need an accident or um, a volunteer error to lose the data. The uh, media just simply isn't designed to be a permanent storage solution. Um, I mean, our kids' crayon drawings will outlast most of that media. Uh, Mike had <laughs> some. Who was doing some research on some of these? Yeah, I'd done actually I'd done some research um, for the purposes of uh, our studio at, at Apostles um, because we have the ability to tape on on uh, tape to record on tape, and so people were asking, well, what's the projected, or disability? The disability, <laughs> yeah. What's the what's the projected average lifespan? That's it's it's about fifty years if the tapes are stored in a temperature controlled environment. They're also supposed to be packed, which means you fast forward and rewind through the entire tape every six months or so. Well, you know, who does that? Who has time to do that? Right. So, you know, another example of it would be you know, faxes, thermal faxes that we all used to use from the 80s and 90s. They're already... They're blank. They're blank. They're unreadable today. They're faded away. So, in you know, digital information the expert is saying, unfortunately, may even have a shorter lifespan. Um, I've seen numbers for burned CDs and burned DVDs that are as few as two to five on whether they're low or high quality media. Hard disks often to fail within five years on average. Uh, flash storage, they're saying up to 10 years, not really due to age, but it's more, ha more has to do with the number of write cycles. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a bunch of digital media that could be corrupted or gone within 30 years. So in, in um, researching the film, I just came across a lot of disturbing stories 
that show it's already happening on a big scale. Um, NASA's moon landing data is no longer readable. Um, medical research has been lost. I read about changes unintentionally being made to a CAD design of a, sub, a nuclear submarine just due to a software upgrade where solid lines became dotted lines. Mm -hmm. um, then you add to that the fact that companies go out of business. Uh, so if they had any kind of proprietary code, uh, you might be in trouble. You might not be able to view that old data on your new machine. Yeah, and so from, from our perspective, to kind of sum up this section, and unless churches are, are migrating data, anything created and stored in a digital form to, to new formats or more permanent formats, that data could disappear in time. So currently the only digital alternative is to determine what is essential to preserve and then faithfully copy it every few years. Right, and have a plan to do so, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Now we all have a plan. <laughs> right. That's one aspect of this, this whole conversation, but I think at the conference that Sally referenced in, in Las Vegas, you, you branched out a little bit, not just to digital document storage, but the safety and security of those documents and identities and those kinds of things. Tell us a little bit about how that conversation went. Um, we had an impromptu panel. I thought it was actually a great idea that two panels were left unscheduled and so people had an opportunity to propose ideas and the topic came out up about um, the threats that might come to a church through the portal of technology. Well, it was very fascinating. Even if your church doesn't stream sermon videos or use social media or some of the more sophisticated uses of technology, one example that somebody brought up on our panel was the threat that could be from like your own copy machine. That's right. That uh, insignificant looking copy machine sitting over in the corner in your church office. Before printing a copy, a lot of people don't realize this, copy machines, including rented machines, they store the data on a hard drive inside. And criminals purchase old copy machines when they're junked, and then they steal the data that's on the hard drive. So from a solution standpoint, whether you lease or whether you own your own copier, don't return it or dispose of it without removing the hard drive because it's likely, you know, look at the things that are probably copied for mm -hmm. churches, member records, internal documents, maybe banking records, offering information, a lot of personal information would, would be at risk. Another threat that came up um, in the panel was internet security. Um, at the conference in November 2013, the latest threat was the ransom malware. That was the one that approached the victims through phishing techniques, it encrypted their data, and then demanded a cash ransom. And if the user didn't pay the cash ransom, the data was deleted, often just within two or three days. It's I still happening, but it's um, Our new home Chamber of Commerce got that crypto locker ransom. Happened to all the data of the new home Chamber of Commerce. They just sent out and had all this publicity here in New Ulm. Oh, it's terrible. That very thing. It was awful. That is horrible. So if it can happen on a government level, how much more so, as Martin was saying, when you have volunteers that are responsible for things in the church? Um, I mean, this month, the new threat that we're hearing about um, is um, the heart bleed virus. Yeah. So, Martin, have you, uh, have you guys been impacted by that heart bleed virus? No, that was the first thing that I did. Uh, there are tools that you can use. LastPass is one that provides a, a checker, so you plug in your website addresses. and. And fortunately, most of our uh, e-commerce type websites that uh, maintain usernames, passwords, and uh, pass through credit card information are running on Microsoft servers, IIS, which was not affected by OpenSSL, which is the uh, open source SSL security software that was most affected by this. So I can put all of our Wells listeners at ease because we weren't, we weren't affected That's by that, but many, many sites were. Yeah, well, I found I found it really interesting that it's not it's not a, a a virus that's on your computer. It's it's actually a programming flaw in OpenSSL that websites that you visit use. So I did a bit a little bit of looking into it, and I, what I found was that the industry is responding by recommending some steps to take, whether you're consumers or institution. Uh, the very first one is exactly what you mentioned, Martin, is you use a tool 
that there's various tools available from the web that you can check to see if a website is impacted. Um, I used I, I used one from Norton just from Norton's. Mm -hmm. And the other thing they said was just, you know obviously change passwords for any websites where privacy and security might be a, a concern. Um, another real big one is don't click on websites that are embedded in emails that you get that you don't know really who they're from. Uh, and then of course they recommend to monitor credit and bank account bank uh, account cards for unusual activity. But it was surprising who was on the list. There were some big institutions, big educational institutions. Um, lots of people made vulnerable. One thing we've noticed is that there's often a surge in cyber threats over holidays um, for whatever reason. So that might be some time that a volunteer at church wants to pay special attention. Um, the heart bleed hit the media, at least primarily around April 1st. April Fools. But, you know, cyber threats are an ongoing challenge. Somebody in the organization has to take responsibility for knowing what's out there, um, what to do, and um, virus protection services like Norton or Symantec, they usually have um, regular reports where you can kind of keep your finger on the pulse. Yeah, from a, you know, really from a church standpoint, the solution to that whole thing really is two parts. First, the churches should keep their virus protection up to date. Maybe one staff member in the church could be responsible for that on a weekly or maybe even a daily basis. And then secondly, educate the staff to be wary about opening any of those attachments from unknown, unknown sources. Like there have been some really interesting ones, you know, fake FedEx notifications, fake emails from, from government, it, yeah, government entities. You know, sometimes they'll use double extensions, like a dot doc dot exe, and as soon as you see that dot exe, that's an executable file. And if you double click on that thing and open it on your computer, you're really opening yourself up for trouble. Uh, sometimes they'll they'll you'll see a, a link, a URL link, with one letter that's left off. Microsoft yeah. dot com, <laughs> something drop, like that. Drop the T off the end or something like that, and any any of those things that that can uh, come up and bite you, especially if you double click on them and they they say that they're going to make a change to your machine, obviously not good. And obviously back up your data. Definitely. Well, lots of good action items come out. It came out of the conference and obviously out of this conversation as well. Any other tips specifically that churches um, should be aware of, action items oh, yes. that they should do? <laughs> We're barely getting started. Um, I mean, just broad strokes here for the sake of time, but if you want us to expand on anything, just let us know. Um, one would be back up, or not back, back it up, um, secure your church server. You can't have unauthorized people who have access to the church server. Yeah, we only, for example, at Apostles, we have a server room, a separate server room, and there's a lot of people that have keys to the church. There's only three tech team members that have keys to that server room. And that doesn't even include us. We've got studio keys, but not <laughs> server keys. Um, and church computers need to be kept secure. Um, our offices are designed to welcome people in, not keep people out. Well, you have to think about um, that computer on the desk. Would somebody be able to slip in and have access to it, or even physically pick it up and steal it? Um, our computers locked up and secure when you have a lot of people on the campus for an event or activity or or um, even for your church services. Yeah, could somebody could somebody break a window and get in and take your computers? You know, the loss of the equipment isn't that bad of a deal, but the loss of the data and the information that that really can be devastating. Yeah, there's a couple levels of that too. It's not just uh, identity theft or some things that could happen as a result of knowing more information about your members, uh, but just the credibility you know of the congregation in that respect or the school in regards to supporting its uh, quote unquote its constituents and uh, just that trust level so the the members are entrusting you their information the school parents are entrusting their children's information to you you need to treat it as such you really just can't afford the black eye that it, it gives a church um, especially when it comes to information on members their offerings or private matters right right um, obviously passwords would be another another issue right yeah it, the whole that's another really interesting thing is the whole issue of of the strength of your passwords right 
you know, unfortunately, I think that a lot of us, and that might even include us mm. <laughs> at Apostles, you know, we'll use maybe a, a password that's based on a familiar verse of Scripture or something. Don't even say it. That's not... Because <laughs> I'm sure there are churches that yeah. have the same shared password. Right. That's Those aren't strong but passwords. But also just keeping it in plain sight. For example, in the studio where a lot of our volunteers use the same edit computer. Mm -hmm. So it's tricky. Right. Yeah. Yep. And again, um, like you say, it is a public place, uh, but there are there are, there are absolute concerns. And a lot of churches or schools think, well, we're just small potatoes. We don't we're not a bank. We don't have anything to steal. But but you really do. You'd be surprised at uh, what uh, criminals would would make use of or could make use of for things like identity theft and and phishing and those kinds of things. So, uh, but, Jess, and, and, go ahead. It, um, you know, it's not even just keeping the information secure, it's keeping personal records secure. Some horror stories that came up at the um, conference included um, uh, some others who had used a collaborative document to talk about a disciplinary action against a member. Somehow that got published, and when that member searched on his name, and the on uh, uh, just a Boolean search, it, this disciplinary action came up and he sued the church mm -hmm. uh, saying that that kept him from getting a job. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, there were other horror stories in the same vein. Yeah, so really the lesson there is if somebody has to take the time to understand the security settings yes. that are in these different applications like Google Docs and Dropbox and Yahoo groups so that you're not risking sensitive information like that, you know, church disciplinary action, student records, financial information, anything like that. If it, you know, if it appears online, y you could have legal problems. Yep. And there's just some... Unintentional publication? Some right. There's just some common sense... I'm sorry? Kind of things. There's just some common sense kinds of things as well. So, you, know, you publish your, your weekly, uh, you know, bulletin, which maybe includes the usher schedule. So... You know, somebody who is smart could figure out, well, th this guy's at church ushering from 8 to 9 on Sunday morning, uh, easy mark. Um, so those yep. things. Funeral are information. Um, or one of the things that came up at the conference was uh, that a, a church had gone back and digitized old newsletters, and one of the newsletters included sensitive information about a missionary who was in a dangerous right. mission field. Right should have never happened. It probably should have never been in print in the first place. Yeah, they, that, they shouldn't have been sharing the name with, uh, of a vulnerable, vulnerable person like that. Right. right. Well, unfortunately, we could... Uh, the good news and bad news is we've yeah. covered a lot of ground, um, but there's so much more that we could cover. So we'll have to have you back at some point in the future, and there's just uh, so many things that you, you need to be aware of. But again, just good common sense and uh, paying attention to some of these things is, is really the first step. Just be awareness, which I think, you know, the conference and the topic there really, really raised. So thanks for bringing that up, and thanks for uh, sharing with us your knowledge today. Really appreciate it, Jazz and Mike. Thank yeah, you. Welcome, I Mike. mean, we just want to stress, we are pro-technology and strongly encourage people to use it and use it well. Yeah, and I think there's a there's a scripture verse that's that's particularly fitting from Second Timothy verses uh, chapter one verse seven, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self discipline. Yeah. I think that goes for technology. Beautiful. Yep. Definitely. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Uh, enjoy your San Jose weather, and uh, we will catch up with you soon. Blessings on your work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, and Thank you. blessings on your work as well. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Bye-bye. Wow, they're like a super couple. I think we're going to have to get them capes or something. That's awesome. <laughs> that, um, that topic was kind of unexpected at this conference, which was really focused on outreach, but I think very appropriate because um, using technology tools for outreach obviously was in play at the conference, but that comes along with some caveats, some some concerns, some things that you really need to think about. And boy, it is it is really difficult for a lot of congregations to stay ahead of this and all those things. I don't. Where do you start? Yeah, I think I I felt guilty. Um, I'm not involved in the day to day operations at at St. Paul's where we're members now, but just thinking back um, to the church and school office work at. St. John's and Sleepy Eye, and I think everybody that's listening probably heard 
some loopholes that they have in place currently in their their office settings that they really do need to address to to pay attention and you know someday it might just be too late and you might be sorry so better to to take the time and, and effort now yeah I think um, you know, you're taking a first step by actually listening to this podcast because we talk about these things all the time but um, you really can't underscore enough the importance of documentation and policy because you have to assume that even though you may know about this stuff, the person that follows you and is responsible for it at your congregation or school may not. So the approach uh, needs to be carefully planned. And, and rather than just throw new technology at a, solu at a problem, uh, it, it, you really need to kind of weigh the value and the consequences of that and you know what what could possibly go wrong you know next year or or three years from now if you go down this road versus well everybody's doing this and so it, it's really kind of a weighty topic that probably is underestimated and uh, you know probably not taken as as seriously as congregations really need to do because technology is a part of ministry yeah, you know, Martin, I'm just reminded of something you said earlier in the podcast about how uh, we maybe sometimes struggle and, and wonder what should we sh what topics we should cover on the podcast. And some of those sessions aren't pretty because it's challenging to think through a challenge like that. And I think that's really what um, where this becomes uh, implemented is that if you take the time and meet some of those challenges um, associated with the dark side of the internet, you you dedicate an hour a month or something to do brainstorming to to consider ways that you could improve your security, things that you need to be doing, and you just you know sweat through some of those difficult topics, trying to look at it from different angles and see what your liabilities are and how to correct those. Right. So um, check the show notes and for, for different things that were, were brought up there. And uh, if you have other ideas and other suggestions for how congregations and schools can deal with these, you know, these darker issues, uh, please share those. Those of you that are watching online uh, live, feel free to ask questions. That's one of the features and benefits of, of joining us live. You can click the uh, Ask a Question button, and uh, you'll be prompted to ask that question, and we'll try and answer it on the air. Sally, we should move along to our ministry resources section and lo and behold we've got a couple of uh, contributions there. We do. First up I want to share um, an iTunes app that Pastor Rob Gunther sent our direction. It's new from Logos Bible Software and it's called Flashcards for Greek and Hebrew. And uh, those of you that are Greek and Hebrew scholars amongst us, you may appreciate having a new flashcard program to use. So, um, I know that one. <laughs> you do? What is it? That's God, the us. Okay, very good. You don't, don't show the next one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I don't know if I can. Maybe I should. Oh, it says missed it or got it at the bottom. There you go. So you right. passed. Okay. So then you can press the button to indicate that you got it correct, and, and it keeps some stats of, of your efforts and things. So, cool. That's neat. Yeah. Is it Greek, or is Greek and Hebrew? It's Greek and Hebrew, and it's free. So can't beat the price if you're an iOS user. Don't show me uh, any Hebrew. Go grab it. <laughs> they don't have screenshots of that. Maybe okay, that's good. a little too intimidating. Nobody <laughs> would download their software. But anyway, uh, a good ministry resource to add to our list. Also, um, I came across a website, Christian Tools of Affirmation. It's ctainc.com. And this is basically just a, a, gifting, uh, a gift site that has Christian um, memorabilia. Or confirmation coming up. Yeah, they've got all kinds of events covered. So if you're looking for something for Father's Day or Mother's Day or pastor appreciation or whatever, they also have it organized by Bible verse, by different themes, um, and different types of products. So, um, you know, nice to have on the list of things. Maybe uh, you're in a bind and need to find something. They, they seem to have a pretty expansive uh, inventory. Cool. So check it out. If you uh, want to contribute a ministry resource of your own, uh, similar to what Pastor Gunther did, uh, feel free to do that. Let us know at wellstech at wells.net or communicate with us in some other way. We'll share it on the show, and we'll also enter you to win a Apple TV at the end of May. Time is running out, 
So you only have uh, four or five weeks to do that. Same with listener reviews. If you have a product, service, hardware, software, printer, um, thumb drive, whatever it is that you feel has some value and you want to share your experiences with it in the form of a review, that can be a written review, blog post, uh, YouTube video, uh, share that as well and we're giving away a Nexus 7 tablet for those people who submit listener reviews. Wow, that's pretty impressive. You got a pretty good chance to win so you should get your entries in. Odds are actually very good this year. So. <laughs> yeah. We haven't had a lot, especially in the listener review category. Yeah. Let's move on to our tips of the week. My tip is very timely in that it, it de deals with password security. We just uh, had a conversation with Mike and Jazz about passwords. And uh, let me do a quick screen share for those of you watching the video. And uh, this is mostly for you people who use LastPass, which we talk about on the show fairly regularly. Uh, with this Heartbleed virus, um, LastPass has been very on top of this and they provided some tools that allow you to check all of the sites and passwords that you have uh, that may have been susceptible to the Heartbleed virus. Um, so if you simply go into your LastPass and I've got Chrome up here but it will work on all the all the platforms uh, click on your uh, LastPass icon go to tools and the very first item under tools is security check and in security check it'll pop up a form that'll say what's your security fitness level and then it offers you a challenge ready to take the last pass security challenge start the challenge and when you start it it's going to open up your vault it's going to look at all your sites I happen to have 712 of them only 712 huh? Only 712 it'll analyze your passwords and uh, look at how strong they are but it also analyzes the sites to determine how susceptible they were to that virus and uh, if you need to do something with them so here it gives me a report on all the sites that uh, it uh, may have breached that I may want to deal with and then gives you kind of a listing of all of the results so I can uh, look at their recommendations and it gives you kind of ranking which doesn't make a lot of sense in the context of uh, other people but it tells you which sites are safe uh, when the, the age of your password on those sites and when they updated their certificate so they uh, they want to make sure that you don't go to that site until uh, the site has corrected the bug so in a, in a couple cases um, Flipboard being one, uh, Powtoon, which we, uh, I don't know, if is that still around, Sally? I it think is. that was actually replaced. No. Um, that's another one that says wait because they haven't fixed their problem. But all the other ones say go update. So I could click on these links, go right to the page that I would need to go to, um, and then update my password, and then LastPass would uh, do it for me. So of the 700 13 or whatever it was that I had, it's uh, showing me about uh, 40 passwords that uh, are websites that I need to go and change. So that's a good afternoon's worth of work, but nice little utility. If you are a LastPass user, take advantage of that security check that they provide so that you can go right to the sites and, and change your password where appropriate. Excellent. I ran the test as well. I can't remember how many passwords I had but it was something like 712 it's amazing <laughs> how they add up yeah, and know. you know something that we have to be very aware of and maintain security of absolutely mm -hmm. Sally you must have a tip for us I do my tip is because I'm a math person not a writing person not an English person um, wouldn't pass any uh, flashcard vocabulary test at all um, so when I when it comes time for me to do any writing I really struggle with that if I have to write a blog post or write documentation or whatever it may be sometimes that's a real um, stumbling block for me and it slows me down and I kind of him and haw over what to say and and really struggle with it and what I found to be the easiest way to break that writer's block is to dictate instead of actually type out um, what I want to write and many times when I dictate it verbally um, 
then I can get it in a written format, capture it somehow, and be able to edit it, and I can do that really great. But just writing it from scratch, actually typing it out and hammering it out, doesn't work for me. So in order to do dictation, um, my go-to app on my iPhone is Dragon Dictation. Again, a free app available from the iTunes Store, probably also on the um, Google Play Store as well, I would guess. And uh, you just tap the screen, start talking, it records your voice and then translates it into text, which you can email to yourself or upload or whatever you want to do with it. Um, there's no storage right in the app, so you have to do something with the text or you end up losing it. So um, that's you know, just kind of the the flow of using the app. It's not an unlimited time period. I'm not sure how long it records for, but um, you do, you know, it will stop after a period of time and give you the text uh, conversion of it. Um, but then you can email that to yourself and begin to edit and voila, your writer's block is cured. So I highly recommend Dragon Dictation. Yeah, that it takes I've tried that, and I've used the tool before. I've installed it on computers and such. And it takes a little bit of getting used to that you have to talk in complete sentences and punctuation and whatever. But it really kind of forces you to really concentrate, I've found. And uh, that, can be, that can be really helpful. Yeah, I had tried it in the past. I, I think over time they've refined it, and it's... A lot better translation yeah. than it used to be in the past. So yeah. I was I was really pleased with the translation that it did. Good. So. Let's move on to our picks of the week. Sally, oh, what's your pick? My turn again. This is a special week for me. Um, I'm going to share my screen once again to to show you the World Book Night dot org website. Uh, World Book Night is actually tomorrow, April 23rd, 2014, and uh, this is a an effort to share the love of reading with the world, and specifically in the United States, uh, I want to say like a half a million books have been given away. Um, my box is sitting right over there. I should have grabbed it before I started talking, but uh, I'm actually giving away... Um, 20 copies of Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, which was the book I chose um, from the list of books that are part of the program this year. Uh, so you can't really uh, get in on being a book giver now, but I just wanted to make you aware of the event. It's tomorrow, April 23rd, always, because that's Shakespeare's birthday. So that's why they chose their date. And... Um, Book givers are all over the nation, and they have these books to give away, and we're kind of challenged to go out and find people that um, aren't normally voracious readers or whatever, and to give the books to them to inspire them to try uh, reading and get hooked on reading. In addition to um, the World Book Night site, they have a companion site, and I'll also have a link to this in the show notes. It's e worldbooknight.org and just today for the first time they released the free um, World Book Night ebook which is available for free download um, starting today and it's interesting inspiring stories about what books mean to people and uh, just different people's experiences and stuff it seems like a really good ebook I grabbed a copy already and I invite you to uh, grab a free copy of the ebook as well and this year they're actually having a contest of the book night givers like me I'm in that elite I even have a uh, a button to wear tomorrow that says I'm a world book night giver so um, for, for all of us we get to submit our own stories of being givers and and the joy of giving the books and things so next year they're going to give away a free ebook with uh, stories from book givers um, in it so I think this is the the third year they've done it in the United States it started in the UK in 2011 and now moved to the US in 2012 2013 uh, I was a book giver for the first time last year and this year I got my application in even sooner because when you when you fill out the application you have to tell how you would give the books away to whom you would give them um, and then also you list three choices of books you'd like to give and this year I got my first choice last year I think I got my third choice because I was kind of further down the list but this year I got my first choice um, a Malcolm Gladwell book which I'm really excited to give away and uh, 
just a, a super neat program. Didn't cost me a penny to get these 20 free books. Basically, the authors um, give away their rights for, for this purpose, and the publishers print the books for free or for a discounted rate, and there's funding for it from somewhere, and they send these books to the designated book givers across the country. So cool. that's me. So for so people can get this on their radar earlier next year, when do sign-ups start? You know, that's a good question, Martin, and what I would recommend is that you go to the site, World Book Night, and there's a place to subscribe. So you sign up for their newsletter, and then you'll you'll get the notification on the first day that sign-ups start. I want to say it was last fall okay. that I actually signed up. And then there was a period of time, and I got notification that I was selected, and then you go and... Through their, through their website, select a place to pick up your books. And right here in New Ulm, there was the New Ulm Library was a, a designated spot to pick up books. So my books were shipped there. I picked them up last week. They actually had a party for me at the library, you know. So it's a big deal. There's, there's signs up all over the country. Um, there's going to be big um, events tomorrow to celebrate it. And it's just a really neat program to be a part of. Cool. So now you have to find 20 people to give them to. 20 willing readers out there. And I'm really supposed to quiz them and find out if they like to read and challenge them okay. to, to read a good book. So. Well, I've already read that one, but uh, yeah. it is a good book. I know why you picked it. So. Okay, good. Got a good endorsement. Cool. Uh, my pick of the week um, for... I don't know, for maybe a year or two, I've been a big proponent of Miro, M-I-R-O.com. It's basically a, a video and audio indexer, which had a nice feature which would allow you to uh, download YouTube videos. And this is a great uh, boon for, for anybody who doesn't really want to rely on the Internet while they're, let's say, standing in front of you know, 25 eighth graders or whatever, and they need to play a video like my wife does. So she likes to download the YouTube videos versus uh, playing it in real time. So Miro was a great tool until it wasn't, and it stopped working. Uh, I could not get it to download some YouTube videos, which kind of defeated the purpose of using it. I didn't really use some of the other features, but it was awesome for that while it worked. So I had to find another tool, and actually I found one that I really like. Uh, also free. Uh, open source, uh, I don't know if it's open source, but it's freeware. Uh, you can donate to the project, but uh, it's called ClipGrab, clipgrab.org. They have versions for uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux, so three platforms. Um, it's, it's very simple to install and very simple to use. Uh, it supports um, YouTube, Vimeo, and Dailymotion, all three of those it'll search and find. So it just pre presents you with a little search box where you enter in some search criteria or the, the URL for it. Uh, it supports uh, a bunch of different formats, MPEG-4, MP3, AUG Vorbis, uh, WMV, um, the original FLV, you know, MPEG-4 videos, uh, a so the, the common ones, so it's, it's likely that you're going to get a uh, format that you can use. Um, and uh, it just works really slick. It seems to be fast. It seems to be reliable. And um, again, the price is right. So if you are looking for a way to download those YouTube or Vimeo videos, because many times those aren't available for download, uh, you have to play them, uh, so you need this kind of tool. Um, this is what I am using these days when I need to uh, to download those. So that's clipgrab.org. Again, uh, multiple platforms and multiple formats. So give it a try if you if that's something that you need to do in your day to day stuff. Excellent uh, pick, Martin. Thanks for sharing. Um, time to share some calendar items. Yep. We Fire when ready. Several events coming up, starting with the most recent, or the, the one that's closest, and that's actually uh, a special live streaming event this Sunday, April 27th. Uh, it's going to be the National Handbell Festival. 
Wells handbellers from all over the country are coming together at Martin Luther College. I understand there's going to be over 300 of us with yours truly included in the bunch. Um, and we are going to be ringing our bells at 2 p.m. on Sunday afternoon, uh, 2 p.m. Central Time, that is. And you can turn it, tune in to MLC Streams page uh, to watch the concert. And I just can only imagine that it's going to be a good concert and one that you won't want to miss. You've been to uh, these before, right? Have you been to I've one of these? Not rung in one before. I did watch one uh, okay. once when it was at Kettle. I think it was a regional handbell concert. So I'm really looking forward to being a part of it. And I'd love to meet any Wells Techers that are also dingy like me. So if you are at the concert or participating in the handbell choirs, uh, please come up and say hello. I'd love to meet you face to face. She'll be the one with the bell. Yeah, the dingy one. Um, next up on the calendar, June 3rd, Martin and I are going to make an appearance at the Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School Tech and Teach event. This is uh, kind of an in-service type event that's being organized by James Karlovsky and Kurt Gostek over at Kettle Moraine Lutheran. Uh, the idea is school is out and teachers maybe want to spend a little bit of their summertime preparing for next year and new technology that they want to use in their classrooms. So a very relaxed day where we look at all different types of technology. They have a website up so you can check out the link in the show notes and see all the different breakout sessions that will be part of the day. Martin and I are both presenting there and we'll be broadcasting Wells Tech live uh, that afternoon, Tuesday, June 3rd, uh, at the conclusion of the conference. So looking forward to a great day there at Kettle. And actually, I'll tip off our audience that next Tuesday, we're going to have James Karlovsky from Kettle actually joining us um, for a quick interview to tell us more about the event. All right. He's on his way to MLC, actually, took a call. So yeah. hopefully we can talk to him about that, too. So Excellent. And then finally, we will want to mark your calendars for July 30th through August 1st when Martin and I are teaming up to teach Final Web training. Final Web is our web hosting partner. Over uh, 550 Wells congregations, schools, um, and organizations use Final Web as their web hosting platform. And, you know, Every web hosting platform has its rule book and its tips and tricks, and we're going to spend uh, several days at the end of July uh, teaching those who attend our classes all about the system. We have a day dedicated just to teachers. Uh, that's July 30th, uh, where we'll July look 29th. at... Sorry, July 29th. We'll look at classroom websites and all the things you can do um, to support your, your classroom. And then July 30th through August 1st is a three-day dummy session. We're going to do it from top to bottom, all the different components. We basically start slow on the first day and add on each day. So if you know the basics, maybe you just want to join us for the end of that session or whatever. Um, whatever fits your needs. Maybe you just want to come for the basics and dip your toe in the water and get started this summer and, and learn the basics. Uh, we're there all week uh, doing Final Web Training and we have information online at bit.ly slash fwtraininginfo. So check it out and get registered. It's it's filling up and we we want you to be there and join us. So. Yep, looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Sally, let's move along to community feedback. All right. Uh, some interesting feedback this week. The first one was a, a question from listener uh, Theodore Klufall, and he wrote to us um, kind of asking an ecosystem question. You know, what platform should I centralize on? Um, in his question, he said, you know, he uses uh, Windows products and Microsoft products through work. Um, he likes the Apple um, ecosystem, but he doesn't care for iCloud. Um, and he's not a fan of Google. So, you know, where do you go? Do you centralize on one thing? Do you use the best products that are out there, including maybe Evernote and Dropbox that are outside the scope of a, a Microsoft-type centric solution or whatever? And he asked me and you for feedback, <laughs> and that was interesting. I think you're probably a lot better at giving that kind of feedback than I am, but I basically said um, I'm a Google girl, so I would I don't think I fit with with his direction because he wasn't a fan of Google. So um, you, on the other hand, Martin, are more probably in the Microsoft camp, I'd say. Yeah, I guess I'm in all the camps, but <laughs> more an occupational hazard. And maybe that's a caution, too, that I'd, uh, that I'd give to, to Theodore and whoever else is kind of wrestling with this. Is You can spend a lot of time debating this and tweaking your system and 
you know, using all kinds of uh, tools and moving content and trying to find the perfect solution. There isn't one out there. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, I would say, pick a horse, ride it. Uh, if it if it does the job, even if it doesn't do it perfectly, it's not probably usually worth the effort to to uh, to try and cobble together, craft together the perfect solution. It just doesn't exist because things change. Um, I would say they all have their pluses and minuses. Just you know, use whatever works for you. Yeah, and we'd love to hear from others if they have a particular setup that works well for them. Um, Theodore gave us a lot of details about different things he yeah. uses. Very and thoughtful email. We really appreciate that. Definitely. And, you know, I just think there's no right one right way. And actually, um, the interview with Mike and, and Jazz kind of <laughs> reiterated the fact that whatever you adopt, it's going to bring probably be outdated in a matter of years or months or whatever, you know, and you're going to end up moving elsewhere in the future. So um, be sure you're keeping backups. and, and Change you know. is inevitable, right? That's right. So um, next up, we heard from our friend Pastor Rob Gunther. We mentioned him earlier in the show. He also wrote to us about our DIY efforts, Martin, and um, maybe not exactly a DIY alternative to our iPhone stands that we shared on last week's show. Oh, well, I think it counts. Let me um, share my screen. He sent us a link to Office Depot and a business card holder. And for the price of five bucks, you could set your um, iPhone or smartphone, whatever brand it is, uh, in a business card holder. And um, he says it's not as cheap as your frequent flyer card, but maybe it looks a little bit nice, nicer. I don't yes. know. It doesn't have your name on it, but whatever. And he said it's also cheaper to buy than a paper cutting machine, which was my solution. Yes. <laughs> um, although, caveat that you don't have to have a paper cutting machine to, to make my solution, but probably more sturdy, like he said. So yeah. um, a good alternative and a cheap price tag and, and a hack. I would call it a DIY solution. I, I so. would throw that in the pool, yep. Definitely. All right. Um, I will also make mention of some email correspondence I had with my friend Jackie Heeb, who's a past president at LWMS and has started a private group on Facebook um, using uh, around LWMS type post. So this isn't the official LWMS Facebook page, but just a group of um, friends through LWMS, that kind of thing. And she ran into an interesting problem, Martin, and one that I would think others may have experienced or may experience around Facebook security. So there were different um, maybe mission updates. She had followed a particular mission site or whatever it was on Facebook, and she would use the share button on Facebook to share um, their photos or their updates or whatever. And she um, occasionally would have people report to her that they could not see the information, that it was being blocked to them. So um, what I found, and I'll include links in the show notes, was some information in the Facebook Help Center, which basically explains the fact that that original poster of the content sets the security permissions. And they may allow you to see it. They may allow you to share it. But ultimately, they may say that only their friends and their friends of their friends can see it or whatever. So if a person in your group isn't friends with the right people, then they won't have the security permissions to see it the same way as you. And I thought it was a good lesson. I mean, um, you know, you can always republish content not using share and kind of override their security permissions, but that kind of defeats the point of allowing them to have security on it. Yeah. Um, I think it more the lesson I take away from it is that Facebook isn't your own site, that you aren't in control of the content, and Facebook does things that you nece aren't necessarily aware of, regard you know around the security and the permissions and things, and you know that's not a bad thing. Um, there has to be some security in place. Obviously, people are sharing a lot of stuff, but um, I think ultimately you don't want to center your communication plans around a Facebook page. You don't want to give them that kind of control over your communication. And so I'm kind of in favor of, you know, having your own communication platform, your own website that you understand the permissioning around and then, you know, maybe using a Facebook page to point people to your website right. or whatever. Right. More so. promotional, yep. Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of some food for thought. I, not really what Jackie was necessarily looking for. I think she was looking for more the tech, technical explanation of the permissioning and things that she was experiencing. But just kind of made me 
or drove home to me who really owns that content. Um, it's not really um, something that you have complete control over, right. even though you'd kind of like to think you do because <laughs> it's your page or whatever. But. but then again, this is Facebook. so Yeah. So one more community feedback, Martin. It was from you. You were doing some tweeting this week. Uh, just a little bit. So let me um, actually share my screen one more time. And it's basically an infographic, how to create the perfect password. All kinds of great information on here. One of the coolest things is they have a three-column three image here talking about what characterizes a weak, medium, or strong password. So, um, you know, the, the weak uh, are pretty obvious, made up of lowercase characters only. Use your name, your pet's name, your birthday, other common names. Uh -huh. One to six characters long, dictionary words, re re repeat previously used passwords, contain keyboard patterns or swipes, you know, QWERTY or 1234, that kind of stuff. But then on the strong side, they think they've got some good advice. Combinations of upper and lowercase letters, numbers and symbols, eight characters or longer. Uh, upper and lowercase numbers symbols contain uh, made up phrases to help you remember it a little bit. Uh, no complete words and then change regularly to prevent hacking. And then as you scroll down this infographic, uh, there's a neat section down here that, that kind of talks through uh, you know, the how-tos. Use upper and lowercase letters go for length over complexity. For instance, a 10-character password can be cracked via brute force techniques in one week. A 15-character password takes 1.49 million centuries. Mm -hmm. um, so just adding a few extra characters makes a big difference. Don't use dictionary words, slang, names, email addresses. Get yourself a password manager. I would highly recommend something like that, like LastPass, or they recommend KeyPass or One Password. Obviously, don't uh, share your password to anybody, and be vigilant. Uh, obviously, stay on top of it. This is your identity, so you want to make sure you are protecting it. And uh, long gone are the days where people can say, "Well, you know." I I don't I don't do much on the internet therefore you know I'm pretty safe you're really you're really not because uh, if it's out there um, it's it's potentially vulnerable so it's my little contribution to community feedback I'll just share a little bit of um, personal <laughs> experience this past week I went to help someone and they pulled out their password list from their desk drawer and said, you know, and then they want me to change them and it messes up my paper that I have written out so neatly with all my passwords. And, you know, I feel your pain, folks, but you got to get over that. This is something you have to take responsibility for and you need you to do it in a secure yep. way. And then you tell them you can't use the same password for any two systems. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Way to win friends and influence people, huh? <laughs> That's why you need a password manager. Yeah. I agree. If I had used the same password for the 712 sites that, that I have in oh. LastPass, can you imagine if somebody got that one password, I'd have to change all of those? Uh, not good. No, I think your identity would be pretty shot if that were the case. <laughs> yeah, so. Just give up and crawl under a rock. <laughs> <laughs> just give them a checkbook. <laughs> All right, is that it for community feedback? I think so, yes, sir. Uh, next week is kind of a tech director, ed tech director's free-for-all. <laughs> so we're inviting some of uh, the tech directors around the Senate to come in and talk about uh, infrastructure for going to one-to-one -to -one computing. So this is, is this our ed tech week? It, it is. It's um, normally our Gail um, co-host week, and Gail will be definitely joining us, but we'll have a, a few others along for the ride. There was some um, email correspondence that went around a month or so ago that I thought would make a great discussion on Wells Tech and that others would benefit from. Great um, knowledge among these group of, of wonderful educators that we're blessed with in the Senate, and I'm just looking forward to having them on and having them share their thoughts. It'll be a good discussion. Happy to announce that we do have a music download this week. Uh, f uh, same artist as last week who provided a, a Good Friday piece, a Lenten piece, Michael Schrader. This time, obviously, an Easter piece, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, both in audio 
and video format. So he's making both of those available. So go to the show notes page, wellstech.wells.net, for the link to those audio and video downloads and enjoy Michael Schrader's uh, beautiful music. Thank you, Michael, for making that available. Sally, I think uh, we're going to call it a day, and uh, good work. I, I, I think the topics that uh, come across our desks are definitely interesting to us, hopefully to our listeners and viewers. Share, uh, spread the word. Let other people know what we do here at Wells Tech, because uh, uh, the more the merrier. This is not any exclusive club. Don't keep this under your hat. This is... Uh, Good stuff for anybody involved with either uh, corporate technology, whether it be for a church or school or their business even, but also personal technology. You know, we talk about uh, sharing your faith and social networks and productivity and all that good stuff. So we have a good time here, and we hope you do too. So tune in next week for Episode 339. Thanks for joining us this week. Take care.